um, but I will do my best to get through this. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background about me. Um, I worked for many, many years in an equine therapy facility um, before I went back to school. Uh, worked under therapists using horses to help people heal. Uh, we also worked with a lot of at-risk youth, um, and then we brought on some therapists um, to run some more team buildings and some groups and stuff like that. So I got divorced when I was 40, and I decided it was time to go back to school. So about three weeks later, I was enrolled, and I got my master's in counseling and was in LAC, and during that time, I spent a lot of time in the substance use world. I would say it was a great learner for me. I learned how to run groups. Um, I learned what addiction was um, and what it was not, and um, also got to see clients as they came off of drugs and alcohol, the emotion dysregulation that's underneath that that they've been trying to suppress for so long. So I would say my main focus, I learned how to run groups. Like I'm very comfortable running therapy groups. Um, learned a lot about DBT, learned some CBT, um, and I got trained in EMDR very early on. And what I discovered was clients were not ready for all the EMDR while they were just coming off of drugs and alcohol. However, um, I did get to learn a lot about regulating the system, feeling safe enough for long enough, um, connection, building connection again, um, having resources for them to understand there are moments maybe in time where you felt safe or moments where you felt connected. Um, and also started diving into a lot of parts work. Not really trained, or I don't really abide by one modality, but I am trained in structural dissociation. Um, Sarah Jenkins was my trainer for both EMDR and structural. She has a very well-known practice um, down in Tempe. Um, she also works with horses a lot, and she has an equilateral training where she teaches us how to do EMDR utilizing the horses. I have not done that training yet. Um, so after I was done um, being in the substance use world, Jamie and I had met while I was in the substance use world. We both were. Um, she was in private practice and invited me in to be a part of the team. And I knew that I really, 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 what was drawing me most in was understanding the complexity of humans and what trauma does to our system. And in that kind of led me down all these different pathways of learning and understanding. I am by no means an expert in this um, because I feel like the more I know, the less I know um, and the more complex it gets. Um, and also humans are very complex. So no, no two people that are working with me are alike. We can see commonalities, but what I'm really trying to understand is the system that's sitting in front of me and what happened to it and what they've done to adapt and survive, which is amazing part about being human because we adapt and we survive um, despite very bad things that might have happened to us in our world. Um, so very shortly after entering into private practice, I did get my LPC. I am now a um, independently licensed clinician working towards certification in EMDR, which I don't know, is sometimes a double-edged sword for me. The reason why I'm doing it is that I would like to be able to teach and support other therapists that are doing EMDR one day. So that's why I'm doing not so that I say I have the certification. I've done way beyond the hours that you need it. I've had the consultation, but I'm still doing it and I will get certified in it. Um, wouldn't mind teaching it one day. So um, <clears throat> also very shortly after I got into private practice, I, I made this giant leap off of this high dive and I started doing intensives. And so what that means is the majority of my clients are being sent to me from another therapist to just do EMDR, work with them, and then I'm sending them back for talk therapy. I do keep a small caseload, maybe about 10 clients if that, and most of those are on a four week or every six week. It's, it's really like um, they're just coming to me to check in. Um, so. When I'm doing an intensive with a client, depending on what their story is and what they're wanting to work on, I'm working with one client four days in a row, four hours each day. Um, we break that up into day one is a lot of psychoeducation around parts work, a lot of psychoeducation around polyvagal theory, because I think it's a really easy way to integrate parts work and for them to understand state change, what that means and that they can even begin to notice when they're in and out of states because clients will say, I feel like I'm just always in yellow, I'm always in fight or flight. And maybe we find the moments where they're more in this green ventral vagal zone 
and then they can practice kind of getting in and out of it. Um, and also doing education and case conceptualization around what it is that they actually want to work on. So <clears throat> one of my recent trainings um, <coughs> that I just completed was um, through a uh, company called Beyond Healing and it was SIP or Somatic Integration Reprocessing. And really what the training was, was case conceptualization. And I was having the conversation earlier that if I'm doing what I'm doing, I wanna understand the whys. I've always wanted to understand why. So if I'm learning parts work, why, why do parts exist? Like why, why is that concept even out there? If we're doing EMDR and I'm in a certain phase of EMDR, why, it, why am I there and why am I doing what I'm doing? So my learning part is um, always wanting to do more and learn more, but then I have to remember to kind of slow down and integrate as well. So after that training, I was, I, I learned so much in that training and also really, really understanding why we conceptualize. Why are we an attempt to understand what is happening inside this human body? Um, and then what are we gonna do in order for it to be whatever their goal is? Um, so being curious and um, staying compassionate and staying, it is not about me. It is always about the person sitting on the other side of me and whatever works for that system, I need to adjust to that and I need to attune to that. And I also need to do my own work because it's not gonna work well to have a dysregulated therapist who you lose your cool and all of a sudden the therapist is losing their cool when someone is in a dysregulated state, what their system is really looking for is someone who they can calm down to. The system is always looking for someone who's regulated so that they can get regulated. So my own work has to come in with that too, right? So here we are. Um, met Veronica actually through all of this intensive work. Um, she reached out to me and um, I would say that I have a firm belief that what I do is one modality and that I need a team of people because it, it, I can't be the end all be all and nor do I think that EMDR is the savior to what is gonna heal people. I think that humans heal humans um, and they begin to trust people and they begin to see that they can actually be in connection with people when it's been dangerous their whole entire life. So I'm not actually gonna talk too much about EMDR. I'm gonna talk more about case conceptualization and um, what is actually going on in the system um, when we experience trauma. EMDR, um, I'll get into it a little bit, but it's actually kind of like, it's not boring. It's just hard to understand unless you've been trained in it, but I'll do my best to kind of bring it in as we move along. Um, so anyway, let's just kind of get started on this one. This is me. So basically what this is, is this is not a therapy session. If you would like therapy after this, please let us know. We will get you to good resourced people. Um, confidentiality in here is important. So whatever anyone shares in here and whatever anyone kind of wants to be vulnerable about, let's keep it in here. I think it's important for creating safety. Um, crisis resources are on there. So my first question to you guys is what does it mean to be a human. What does that mean for you when I even say it out loud? If it's individual. What does it mean to be human? Having feelings. Having feelings. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Connection. Oh, sorry. Connection. <laughs> I would say being able to experience the entire range of being human and not not letting fear dictate that you're stuck in one place or afraid to experience the entirety of what it is to be a human. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. What were you saying? Did you say something before that? No? Okay. Anyone else? Mind, a lot of mind. Mind, yeah, we have a mind. And it can be tricky sometimes. <laughs> the dance of moving forward in life, but also um, what it takes with internally to do that your failures, your positives, and how you progress and don't progress. It's Absolutely. that dance. Absolutely. It's not just a linear path. Mm -hmm. The only words that keep coming to me are feel all the feels. Feel all the feels. Yes. Be able to feel all the feels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So in the, in the actual, in the, just the basics of what it is to be human, we are biological organisms. So meaning that we react to stimuli and we reproduce and we grow. <coughs> and one of the coolest things that I think is we adapt, which is a huge strength that can actually get in the way as we get older, but we are very adaptable. And all of this is in to maintain some sort of homeostasis. <coughs> We're also mammals, which means that we give birth to live young, which is hugely important for me. I am big in attachment theory. We cannot survive without our caregiver. We can't, we'll die. Um, failure to thrive is a real thing. Um, and failure to thrive, when I've worked with people who were in orphanages for quite some time or were adopted, the wounding in that is significant. Um, so that's where it all comes kind of back to me. We 100% are reliant on caregivers. Um, and we're reliant on them also for intimate connections. We actually learn through the lens of others. Um, and it's all in pursuit of survival. That is primary in all of us. It is above everything. We will do almost anything in the pursuit of survival. Um, and we also live in community, which is also one of the things that, you know, when most of my clients come to me is what they're coming with is, I'm having a difficult time living in community, either with my husband or my wife or my children or my work or something in my community I feel distant or outside of or not, something just doesn't feel right inside of me. And when I hear that, it's like, wow, that's a, that's a basic need of ours that's not being met. Um, and we have strategies to, to get around that. So we also have a nervous system <clears throat> and it is wired for connection. We can't not have connection. If you look at people that are put in isolation, um, it's, it's one of the worst things that we can do to humans. So our, our nervous system is always wired for connection. And again, it's in the pursuit of safety. And these pursuits shape our development from the small cells in our body to the structure of our brain and the makeups of our mind. So we literally hold it in our tissues. Like it is down cellular level, we're talking about things that happen to us. Any questions about that? We're gonna zoom. So I'm gonna ask you one more question. What is trauma to you? When I say the word, what does it mean to you? Stuck energy, like blocked energy, blocked mm -hmm. emotions or? Like disruption. Mm -hmm. Pain. Injury. Pain, injury. Mm -hmm. Threat to safety. Threat to safety, absolutely. Anything that overwhelms your capacity. Mm -hmm. It's an overwhelm of the system. Something from the past coming back to haunt you. Mm -hmm. Envy, absolutely, absolutely. So one of the things that's interesting about trauma is there is not a universal definition of trauma. And if we were even to go to the DSM, kind of bugs me even there, um, which is our go-to because there is no definition for trauma in there. There's a there is a disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, and I don't even like that definition. It, it helps us understand symptomology and where it might fall. But the problem with, to me even, with the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder is the majority of the clients that I've seen have complex trauma. And that complexity is, it almost, I don't know, it, it, it's hard for me to just say it's post-traumatic stress disorder when it's so complex. Post-traumatic stress disorder oftentimes can be it can help clients understand their symptomology, whether they're hypervigilant or avoidant, avoiding certain things. Um, I kind of describe it, you know, like the, the war veteran that comes home and a car backfires and all of a sudden he's on the ground. It's an, it's an automatic response that next thing I knew I was on the ground. Um, <clears throat> we can avoid social situations. We can also see substance use alongside of that very, very uh, oftentimes. Um, but the complexity behind all of that, I don't think we give it enough credit. I think that we've all experienced trauma. To be born into this world is traumatizing, um, and to grow up in society is traumatizing in itself. And so 
no unified definition, any experience of threat. This one is huge for me, disconnection. This is almost like death by a thousand paper cuts is all the times that I was not attuned to and my needs were not met. Isolation is a big one or immobilization, which when we go through um, dorsal vagal shutdown is kind of like this immobilization. It's something that happens in our brain. Um, and it results in chronic dysregulation of the nervous system, the endocrine system, the emotional body, the immune system, the heart, the spirit. I mean, this is something that impacts many, many levels, not just one or the other. It's not a brain problem. It's a body and brain problem. It's all of us. Um, and we can actually see it now more um, with brain scans and things like that, which is very nice. Um, ethnicity, race, gender, sexual orientation, our backgrounds. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the ACE, um, but really the ACE is one of those that I use to just help me gain an idea. ACE is Adverse Childhood Experiences Scale. Um, before you were 18, did you experience any of the following? It includes moms or dads being hit, them being hit, not having clean clothes to wear, not feeling safe in the home, um, anyone going to prison in their house, anyone threatening or committing suicide in the house. So it just helps give me a little bit of an assessment where are you at on that scale, because I'm always going back to childhood, which some people hate, but that's where I'm always going. But these are all factors that lead into the complexity. So someone might have a recent event that happened, but it opens up a bunch of stuff. Um, so those can all impact factors. It can impact of how complex it is. Yes. I was doing a different training earlier today and they, I wrote down this definition for trauma, which yeah. I thought was a good one. Um, can be too much, too fast, too soon, or too little for too long. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Too much, too fast. Too little, too soon, for too long. It's, it's an overwhelm of this. It's something we can't make sense of and it's an overwhelm for our system. And it has long lasting effects. Um, so I'm gonna get into a little bit about the brain because I think it's important for us to understand how this impacts um, our whole entire system. And <clears throat> so in looking at the brain, um, we have three different parts of the brain. It is very comp. The brain is very, very, very complex. I'm just going to kind of do a top line um, through all of these. So the reptilian brain um, is one of the first to develop in utero. It's the oldest, most primitive part of our brain. Um, it's only care in the world is survival. There's no thought process down there, right? So it also um, regulates our automatic things like breathing, heart rate, things like that. We don't have to think about it and it's also very, very fast part of our brain. Um, and like I said, developed in utero, um, fully developed. It's completed by the time we're born. Um, and it just kind of manages things in the background that we don't have to think about. So the next part of our brain, the mammalian part of our brain, um, emotion, it is loves pleasure, does not like pain. So it's always seeking pleasure, moving away from pain. Um, it develops uh, first six years of life. So kind of can make sense to me when kids are having temper tantrums, they can't manage their emotions, things like that. Their brain is literally developing that. Um, it also contains the limbic system, Limbic system is responsible for emotions. It's responsible for memory. This part of our brain um, allows us to nurture our young. It allows us to be in community with. It's, it's where we see, it's where we find that connection part of our brain. It's also uh, first six years of life. So where I'm working most with, most of the time, I'm usually floating back around that area. Um, and it's, it's basically our, our subconscious, whereas the reptilian brain is the unconscious. We, we don't have access really to that, but we do have that subconscious. And I'm always kind of telling clients like it's, it's driving what your present day reaction is to things based off of the neural networks it made way, way, way long ago. Um, so 
one of the reasons why I think EMDR is, is so great is that because it allows them to drop into psyche and not be up here in this rational brain. So the rational brain, logic and thinking, um, it completes development by about age 25. So <laughs> we're still developing our brains until about 25 years of age which is crazy to me, um, thinking that I thought I was an adult at 18 and really my rational brain was still not done developing. Um, it's evolutionary, the youngest part of the brain, and this is what separates us from all other mammals, is because we have that logic and reason. Um, it's responsible for hindsight and foresight, it's insight, uh, making sense of things, telling the story of, um, it's also known as the like executive center of the brain, responsible for learning how to tell us the story of what happened. So when we're looking at like this part of the brain, this is more like state or emotion, and this part of the brain is, is the story, making sense of the emotion that we experienced. So we'll move on to what happens when we experience trauma. So when we're experiencing something that's overwhelming to the system, the first part of our brain to shut down is the rational part of our brain. It literally is too slow. It's the, the back part of our brain is saying, you can't react quick enough, so I'm just gonna take you offline and do what needs to be done until this situation is over. Um, so you'll see a top to bottom while experiencing trauma, as well as while processing a traumatic experience. This means that the rational part of the brain <coughs> will go offline first. So what you may see if you come across a car accident or you see someone who is in shock is that loss of clear speech, the loss of the ability to make sense of things, time sequencing stuff may be off. This is why it kind of frustrates me sometimes when you know people are expected to tell the story in court of something really ter horrific that's happened and they, they have time lapses. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the brain. We're being inundated with a ton of cortisol, a ton of adrenaline, and it is all in survival. It's all in pursuit of that we survive this experience. So this may cause one to be stuck in an emotional and somatic processing of the experience. So what we'll often see in our office is things like, I don't understand why I'm reacting this way when there's nothing bad happening in that moment and I just can't help it, the next thing I know I'm screaming, the next thing I know I'm hitting something, the next thing I know I'm just so, I'm not even there, I'm out of my body. Um, <clears throat> so the shutdown sequence continues, one may be left in a purely survival response. So what this can look like um, in, in my office is someone who is either hypervigilant, anxious all the time, can't slow down, really distracted, workaholic, alcoholic, and all of that is the brain trying to calm itself down, but it can't because the trauma's not there. So when we're talking about trauma, it's not in our rational brain, that's not where it happens. The rational brain is trying to make sense of what happened, but everything under here is our subconscious and it can't connect to it. So the, the neurons can't make sense of what happened, and so they misfire all the time. So someone may smell something, see something, hear something, feel something, and it's as it were really happening, and my, my body's responding in a way like it's really happening again. And it's because where the memory is stuck, all of that is stuck with it. The sights, the sounds, the body sensations. So when we're working in EMDR, we will utilize all of that. We, we actually, when we ask the questions in EMDR to go in on the target, I'm gathering all of that information. What emotions do you notice? Where do you notice it in your body? What's, you know, what's the story you tell yourself? A negative belief around that. I'm gonna die, I'm not gonna live through this. I'm not lovable. It was my responsibility, it's my fault. I'm not in control. If I experience this, I'll, I'll explode. 
and that neuro network where it's stored, which is usually in that mammalian type brain, is that it's like a floater in there. And it just floats around and it's not connected into the rest of the brain. And so what I'm doing is I'm trying to have the brain be all in connection with each other. So we realize it's over. It wasn't my fault. I'm learning how to keep myself safe. You know, whatever, whatever that positive cognition we're trying to get into a, to a network that's floating and doesn't understand. It actually is state dependent. It's the age you were when you experienced the event. So when I see someone having a complete meltdown in a grocery store, I'm like, oh wow, where's the bottle? Little six year old, like, that is a response that doesn't match the current situation. That to me is always trauma. It's always trauma coming through. It's always about the past. So trauma rewires the nervous system. Threat perception system is enhanced, meaning I'm always feeling like I'm on edge. I never feel safe. I never feel settled. I'm reading my notes. And then, <coughs> Um, so people might be scanning for safety all the time, um, and we get hijacked and stuck in activation and stuck in a fight, flight, or freeze, or fawning type response. Um, it can rewire the affective <coughs> circuits. Affective circuits are one of the things that develop in utero as well. They include seeking, rage, fear, what else is there, lust, panic play and joy. So when we're working with pre-verbal trauma, this is something that happened either in utero or before two years of age, one of the things that we'll do, we, this is a, we use the hands, we use the body because it's, it's so young in age, you wanna make sure you're kinda of actually making connection. And it's a really fast tapping because it's, sim, it's um, similar to mom's heartbeat. Um, and what I'm doing in affective circuits is I'm making sure they actually got wired properly because if they get wired in properly, you're born with your circuitry off. So it's like the, the affective circuits are going first, and then we're learning and we get these kind of working models in our brain, which is I'm always trying to predict how you're gonna react based off of the experience I just had. That's how our brain develops over time. It's always going from base up. My brain is always trying to predict how you're gonna react based off of my past experiences. So if it's skewed, I might react to you in a way where you're like, I don't even know what I did, but my eyes and my ears can't see you right. They can't process what's happening correctly. <clears throat> this also controls behavior. So a lot of times we'll see the behaviors looking something like uh, addiction. They can look something like uh, breaking the law. They, I mean, they can look so many different ways. They can look like dissociating into too many movies. They can look like gambling. They can, I mean, there's shopping addiction. There's, there's everything and what that is, is our brain trying to distract us away so we don't have to feel these emotions over here. I'm seeking pleasure to move away from pain. Problem is, is that it's kind of like on an equilibrium. So I can have a little bit of chocolate and then when I go back, I'm like, I really, really, really want another piece of chocolate. So I'm gonna have a little bit more chocolate. And then I'm gonna, oh, I really just wanna, and then all of a sudden we're like, uh, I've gained 10 pounds because my pleasure seeking brain, I'm keeping away from the pain on the other side of it. Same with addiction, right? If addiction, if, if alcohol and drugs didn't work, we wouldn't do it. <laughs> we wouldn't do it. If shopping didn't work, we wouldn't do it. If reading and dissociating off onto a Netflix for 20 hours didn't work and take you away, you wouldn't do it. But the problem is, is the withdrawal on the other side. And that's gonna get me into a cycle, right? I'm avoiding all of this stuff so that I don't feel the pain. And part of my work is, can we grow the capacity to experience the pain and really, really move through it? And it's not an easy process, um, but what I found is people are so resilient. It's really amazing. Trauma is the most powerful influences on our mammalian brain. Information processing and filtration systems are compromised. So the information processing and, filt and filtration systems are compromised. Meaning I don't hear with my whole ear, I don't see with my whole eyes, I can't perceive whether or not this is a real threat or just kind of something happening that feels uncomfortable. Um, it leaves the emotional brain compromised. 
and hyper-focused, and that is being fed by the fear-driven reptilian brain. So the reptilian brain's going, we're in danger, we're in danger, we're in danger, and then the emotional part of our brain doesn't understand that we're not in danger anymore. Um, when trauma occurs, both of the amygdala um, and the hippocampus are highly activated and they become stuck in activation. So basically what our amygdala is, is our alarm system. The amygdala is the one that fires and says you're in danger, move. You're in danger, fight. It, it, it's the activation in it. So we see what we see is that it gets stuck and it's constantly going off. This not only creates lots of problems in what my clients think is the brain, but in the nervous system. And over time, the nervous system gets so taxed that it's starting to borrow from other, other systems. So we're seeing direct correlations between autoimmune diseases um, because the, the, the nervous system gets so taxed that it borrows from the immune system because it is the most important system that keeps us alive. It's always in pursuit of survival. What is the most important? Um, <clears throat> the hippocampus will go offline and our hippocampus remembers what happens and it time stamps things. So it's not functioning very well. Uh, so it, that's why people will oftentimes say, I don't, I don't really remember what age I was or I don't have a memory or I can't, I can't think of a time when like my, my years between four and six are dark. I don't remember anything from that time. So the only thing that I'm look like I'm thinking in that moment is, huh? I wonder what system like if you were so activated that the hippocampus couldn't remember it to be true. So it's floats, um, but they might feel body sensations, or they might feel a, a sense of danger or a sense of something. The rational brain uh, shuts down during trauma. Um, which inhibits the ability to make sense of what's happening. And this is the way our brain works. It wants to drop into what, it wants to drop into the emotion and then it wants to make sense of it. That's the storytelling. Um, as a rational brain wakes up, we are left um, to piece together really in foggy, foggy ways, the memory of what happened. Um, and as a result, the way we make sense of information as it pertains to ourselves, others, our relation and our relationships is compromised. So we not only can have these new negative beliefs about ourselves, but we can have new beliefs about the world and about humans in general. They're either safe or not safe. Okay. So along with kind of this layer, the way our brain grows from the brain stem up, it's also, we have a left and a right hemisphere. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the takeaways from this is that it's, it's important for both of our hemispheres to be able to communicate with each other. The way I think about, um, the right brain is going into affect or going into state, going into emotion. Can I feel that and then come back over into my left brain and make sense of it? So it's creating the balance, um, to, so that we can have a whole brain. Um, response. So the right hemisphere is focused on grasping a larger picture. So, um, part of our, our brain also moves us towards goals and dreams, towards understanding and appreciation and relationships um, and connection. It's wildly creative um, and it's adaptive. So the left hemisphere um, it's more focused on making sense of things, gathering details, it's master of organizing, making sense of the past, how it informs the present, um, and all of this is done in the right hemisphere's role and superiority. So what I'll oftentimes see in my sessions is a client is more right-brained or left-brained. So right-brained is um, oftentimes more like creative and artistic and musical, but they can't make sense of a lot of their experience. They, they like to stay really kind of out there in this creative land um, and they feel emotions very deeply and they can be very emotional in session. Um, left brainers, uh, kind of Jamie's favorite population to work with, 
Um, meaning a lot of entrepreneurs are like this. Um, a lot of very you know smart, intelligent people um, that went to school and then they got their masters and then now they're you know they're, they're business owners or they're and they love logic and understanding and just tell me how to solve this. Just tell me how to fix this. I'm here. But when we drop into affect, when we drop into emotion, they want to come right back over and tell you the story. Let me just tell you the story of what happened, but I'm not showing you a lot of emotion around that. Like I can tell you the top line of my terrible, horrific childhood. And I'm like, yeah, it's just not that hard. okay. That's a more left brain person and it is a strategy and it is not to be um, shunned. It's not to be judged. It, it kept them alive. It really, these people tend to come from homes that mom or dad was too much emotion. And so I, my strategy I'm taking on is I'm just gonna be very non-emotional because your emotions are too big for me. So I'm gonna not show that because I need you to be okay. All in pursuit of survival, always in pursuit of survival. <coughs> now I have one issue more. All right, so the other thing I'm looking at is attachment. I, attachment is just so, so, so important to me. Um, and there's so much to be said on attachment and I'm just gonna try and keep it as you know, simple as I can. Basically, like I said in the beginning, we are completely reliant on caregivers from birth through childhood um, for care, nourishment, and guidance. Basically, our humans that are the adults in our life, the caregivers in our life, are teaching us how to be a human. There's no other way for us to learn. Um, it's a cohesive relationship between primary caregiver and the infant. It's crucial for healthy development to ensure the infant's needs are met. Um, this cohesive relationship is, can I do something and you respond? And that's how we learn. If I cry, you come to me. Oh, so maybe I'll do that again and you come to me. But when we're little teeny tiny little infants, we don't have a rational brain. So we don't think, is this an okay time for me to cry? Is this an okay time for me to get my nappy changed? You know, it, it, it's, not, it, it's not reciprocal in that way, but the baby does know I get soothed, I get pressed on a chest. Um, I can fall asleep there. So we learn it very, very early on. So attachment theory is emphasizing how early attachments, especially from primary caregivers, influence our, first, our future relationships. It's always showing up in our, in our present day relationships, the past. Secure attachment in childhood fosters a sense of safety, trust in the relationship with the caregiver, allowing the child to explore the world with confidence. So what you'll find with like littles is like when they start crawling, like they'll crawl away from mom and they'll look back and they'll be like, oh, okay, it's okay. And then I can explore and then I can look back and then I'm exploring and ow, I hurt myself. And I start to cry and mom's like, oh, she gives me a hug, she gives me a kiss, she gives me a little cuddle and then I'm off and I'm exploring again. This is safe attachment styles. This is how we learn. I can come back to safety, get regulated from a regulated adult and then I can go back into the world and explore. Expectations of proximity, care, and reliability with others, it creates the templates. This is where we see secure and insecure disorganized attachment styles come through in adults, right? So I'm really, that's what I'm working with. Childhood experiences with attachment figures shape our internal schemas um, and they guide our responses to present situations. So it is always coming from the bottom, filtering its way up, and this is how I'm responding. See this all the time in couples therapy. So there's two wounded people in trying to cohabitate together and understand one another. Um, actually, most couples are trying to have their partner understand them, but have very little curiosity about their partner. So it's, can I do both at the same time? Can I drop down into that? The internal working models are mental representations formed from lifelong attachments, they experience self-perception and behavior. So internal working models are the very, very, very early building blocks for who we are today, very early. Um, changing present patterns involves working with the embodied schemas developed in childhood, fostering new present moment experiences, engaging in sensory sensations. So basically what I'm doing is I'm going back in time so that we can understand what happened 
and that I'm not that age anymore. I might have alter alternative strategies today and that I don't have to respond the way that I have been. <clears throat> so what we're seeing in the office, what happens during development is we, we all have a true self. We are all born 100% ourselves. We don't have shame. We don't have guilt. We don't, we don't, like I said, we don't think about is it an okay time to cry. These are all things that we learn along the way. And so true self, it, it's, this is where parts work that I do kind of comes in, is that most people will say, I have no idea who I am. Like I've reached this point where I don't even know who I am anymore. And so what I'm attempting to find is the true self. Um, in internal family systems, it's called self, in structural dissociation, it's called the A and P, the apparently normal self. Um, I use a lot of mindfulness in this, is it's curious, it's compassionate, it does not judge. And if I can begin to grow that in someone, can we just be curious about our internal experience about something based off of what's happened outside of us? Sometimes mindfulness works easier on the outside before the inside. Can you practice it in just being curious about other humans? Can you go sit at a cafe and just notice? Notice what you notice. Notice if judgment comes in. Notice the story you wanna tell yourself. Just begin to notice all this. Don't judge it, it's just happening and it's okay. So growing true self can be difficult depending on the complexity of um, childhood experiences. So what happens in misattuned or unstable situations where we have caregivers who maybe you know, we can't quite, we're, we're always looking for how they're feeling or, or we, we have that noticing of dad's coming home. What, what we find out later in life was drunk. Um, and he's kind of like this weird human, not normal dad guy is that I have to find strategies so that I get to stay in that home because I can't be kicked out of the home. And I also can't at five years old pack up my bags and say, peace out family, it's been real, but this is really messed up and my system can't handle it. So the only thing we can do is change our internal system. That's the only option we have at that age. So what parts of personality, strategy, whatever, whatever works for the client, I don't mind. I'll utilize whatever the language is that they wanna begin using, is that we begin to front certain parts of us because they're acceptable and they get us connected enough, safe enough for long enough. But in the background, what we're doing is we're, we're fracturing away from or pushing to the back the other parts of us that don't get to be seen, don't get to be heard, and oftentimes they get lost in the system. So when you're looking at things like multiple personality disorder, is that that is a complete fracture of a system where parts don't know other parts whatsoever and something fronts so, something gets in the front so much that you lose time and you have amnesia, but the part is amazing. It's amazingly adaptive. It kept that human alive. It took on all the trauma for that person. Even compartmentalizing parts is what I'm really working with when I'm in a neuro network where there's been complex trauma happening is sometimes I think about the part is showing you the story it holds that you've tried so long, so many strategies to get away from because that wounded part in there, it, it, no one can touch it again. No one is getting to that again. So I'm gonna put all these strategies out here so that you don't get to that. So building rapport and building it quickly is kind of, I don't, I don't know how I kind of got better at that, but I've gotten better at it. And I think it's just staying curious without an agenda because I can't butt up against protector parts that are protecting something that's wounded back here. It'll put its middle fingers up at me. You'll know it, you'll see it, it's easy. Um, so the false self or these parts kind of come out. Um, the child cannot trust the caregiver is gonna take care of all their needs. Uh, the infant's development and the poor self will include tension between false self and true self. Also between parts of self, they won't like each other. So it's getting to know a system who likes each other, who knows each other um, while we're doing, sometimes even while we're doing the EMDR. I'm always getting the education up front, but sometimes it happens with the bilaterals going. Insecure attachment emerges when all of me is not safe with all of you. It, it just, I got a fracture away. I can't be 100% myself. 
Um, this is the development of anxious avoidant and disoriented attachment styles. Um, and it's, it's all in pursuit of staying safe. It, it really is not something I don't, I don't think the majority of people sit home and plan my ways, how they can mess up their partner. It's always in pursuit of you don't hurt me. I'm gonna come at you because I don't want you getting to that little girl or that little boy that's hurt inside of me. Strategies. So in getting into the nervous system, because this is the other thing um, that is effective um, when we're looking at trauma, it's not me, it's my nervous system. So due to life experiences, we sometimes react without awareness. This is when I know it's trauma. It's like all of a sudden I'm reacting in a way that's not matching what's happening. I'm either overreacting or I'm underreacting. Um, making the unconscious reaction patterns more conscious is a critical part of healing. That's part of what EMDR and parts work is. The central nervous system made up of the brain and the spinal cord, the autonomic nervous system, primary function is to synchronize our system's responses to incoming stimuli. So the way that I use this is the, door, door, um, the polyvagal theory. For me, it's easy to explain and also um, easy for clients to understand some of their parts might lie in fight or flight or fawn and some of their parts might lie in the dorsal vagal shutdown, a dissociated state, SI lies up there, things like that. So sometimes it's, it's, it, it's necessary for them to understand their nervous system, but to also understand that parts might exist within that nervous system. We respond to a stimuli the best we can, the only way we know how. So in ventral vagal is kind of that state that we're all, um, that most of my clients actually say they've never been in, um, but we find the moments that they have been in. Um, what it feels like in there is safe enough, I'm socially engaged, I'm enabling connection, I'm able to connect to others. Um, we'll see regulated heart rate, breathing deep as possible. Um, approachable facial expressions, ability to engage in conversation and filter out distractions. There's also the health benefits to ventral vagal, um, regulated blood pressure, regulated heart rate, strong immune system, good digestion, um, quality of sleep is there. Um, and so we feel overall well, like a sense of well-being and connected, right? So that's a ventral vagal or what I call a green zone. Um, I have a sheet that I hand clients that kind of have like a green, a red, and a yellow, and it has what's actually going on in the body, um, some of the emotions that might lie in there, and a lot of this information is in there so that they can begin to understand their own nervous system. What gets me into a state and what gets me out of a state? Sympathetic responses. <clears throat> so, what is actually hap sorry, is um, activated when we have a perception that there's danger. And if we have an overactive nervous system, everything might feel like a threat. Everything. Even like a, something banging too loud might startle someone who's always in fight or flight. Um, the focus is on mobiliz mobilization and resources. So what I often say is the blood is flowing to your hands and your feet. So I can fight or I can run. It's, it's, it's activating, my heart rate is increasing, my breathing is getting more shallow. Um, it's a signal to act and really it's coming from here and not a lot from here. This, brain, this part of our brain, too slow. It would be dead. This part of our brain is just gonna move us before we know it. Um, the perception of dangerous, chaotic, and an unfriendly world. Common symptoms, anxiety, panic disorder, lots of anger, rage, things like that. Um, the health consequences, heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, headaches, weight gain, chronic neck pain, shoulder pain, back tension, stomach problems, weakened immune system. So for a lot of PTs and, and people like that, that's what you might be seeing in your office and it's just curious it, it's just a curiosity like huh is this just all that's going on do we just have digestive issues or is there more to the story in my world there definitely is more to that story 
So we describe this like yellow. And then in red or a dorsal vagal shutdown, um, really dorsal vagal shutdown was a place that we were not supposed to come back from. A dorsal vagal shutdown is literally our body's last ditch effort at survival. Um, I ought, there's a Peter Levine wrote a book, Waking the Tiger. Waking the Tiger. And I love the way that he described it, like there's a gazelle and a lion, <clears throat> and the gazelle's gonna run and run and run and run and run, fight or flight. The lion gets it, takes it down, and the gazelle's gonna actually play dead. And that is its last ditch effort at survival, and it will not be there. It heart, its heart rate will decrease, its blood pressure will decrease so that the lion thinks, oh, I'm not feeling that anymore. I can release off of it. And the next thing you know, it kind of jerks around and then it's taking off again. Humans, what'll happen is if we're immobilized for too long, if the, per if the perception is I'm not gonna make it, like yellow is I can, red or dorsal vagus shutdown is I can't. Can't do it and I think I'm actually going to die. So shut down, freeze, immobilization, numb, terror, despair. It is the last resort. It's when all the resources aren't there anymore. Um, we also get a huge um, <coughs> surge of dopamine in our body and we dissociate. We go away from, which is like when I kind of learned about this, I was like, well, if that's the way it is when we really do actually pass away, it's kind of like, it's. <laughs> I don't know, it, it made me feel a little bit better about that. Like we're not all there. Our, our bodies take us away from it so that we don't have to be there. We don't have to experience the terror. Um, so these can be seen on brain scans. This is no longer a guess anymore. Um, there is a neurobiological explanation for dissociation. And in, in, if you're in red, I always tell my client, you've got to get into yellow. It's movement, I gotta move. Suicidality lies up there, depression lies up there, hopelessness, helplessness. There's, it's, it's a very, I describe it like pull, pull the covers up over my head and I just don't wanna move. I feel frozen. Um, I've got to get my, my heart rate up. I've got to get some, I gotta get my body moving almost in fight or flight so that I can come back down into green. If I'm in fight or flight, these are where grounding skills really come in helpful. How can I feel my body and just kind of relax back down so that I can get in there? Health consequences with dorsal vagal shutdown, fibromyalgia, stomach issues, IBS, Crohn's disease, ulcers, low blood pressure, type two diabetes, weight gain, um, hormonal imbalances. So, breakdown of the natural information in the processing system and the memory becomes frozen. So remember when I said it's like kind of like a, it's frozen in time and space. It's the age you were, the sights, the sounds, the body sensations, the emotions are all in the frozen state. Um, often results in a persistent intrusive thoughts, negative emotions, negative beliefs, distressing body sensations. This is what I see in my office all the time. Uh, the nervous system is hardwired for connection and relationship, but the most important job is safety. It goes above everything else. The nervous system does not easily dif differentiate between a true th threat to the body, harm versus a social or emotional threat. So there is no such thing as different. Like oft, I have so many clients who will try and compare. Well, it wasn't that bad. Or, uh, and, and the body doesn't know the difference does not know it. So comparison is a very dangerous game when we're looking at trauma. Um, our body is always searching for safety and connection because it is the first and most powerful survival strategy. So when we get into AIP, this is kind of what we do, adaptive information processing. This is what we're looking at after we've kind of case conceptualized. It explains that present day challenges stem from the past events and how the brain processed those experiences. Negative or traumatic experiences create memory imprints and can resurface with current emotional stimuli. These are what people refer to as triggers. Current things triggering past events. I'm having an overreaction or an underreaction to a current day situation. 
It emphasizes the body's capacity to release stored memories and modify present response patterns. Healing occurs when the original response pattern transforms into a more adaptive one, leading to future responses. This is neuroplasticity. This is the most amazing part about our brain, is that we can rewire it. And I see it. Like it is, it, it truly, like when clients come in and they're like, I just am not reacting the way I used to. I don't know what is happening, but it's just happening. And that is the beauty of neuroplasticity, of creating new neuropathways in the brain. Change happens through revisiting the past traumas in a safe, connected state and allowing for healing and shift in response patterns. So you can change the past through modalities. EMDR is one of them. Um, has steps in shifting away the past influences to the present through a more natural phenomenon of memory reconsolidation. So basically what we're doing is we're having the brain understand what happened and that it's not happening anymore. Um, so we do reactivate, we build client's capacity to experience the emotions around it. So a client can come in with a very small window of tolerance, ability to tolerate things, and I have to grow that. Can we take moments? Can we practice what gets us in out, you know, out of red into yellow into green? Can we begin to have that ability to tolerate some, some pretty horrific things? So that we go back and we're looking at the wound, but we're also here in the room with me. I need you here with me while you're going back and visiting some unpleasantry. Mismatch experience, provide a mismatch experience in the present. Um, annulment via new learning, it shifts the brain meaning around the past events by providing the brain with an alternative embodied experience that creates new templates for the behavior in the brain. So what I'll oftentimes see is awareness, understanding, realization, but I describe it, it's not just that I know it, it's like I know it. I know it now. Um, shifting the semantic memory around the past shifts the behavioral activation of the present. This is the path often that, sorry, this is the path that others refer to as getting past your past. So are they still disassociated from their body so they still can't really quite feel the emotions and you're just working with the logical part or mm -hmm. are they, are you, they're allowed, like they're feeling Yes, it is the, when I have clients that are really somatic, you can't, it, it, you can't move the way they're moving. It, I see twitches, I see throats literally get swollen out. I, 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 the twitching that happens is all of the memory that the body is holding. And we are gathering all of that up and we can even go in on sensation. They may have no memory, but I have this thing in my chest and I can go in on that as well. They don't have to have an actual memory. Okay. Yeah. But it is, it is the, a body scan is one of the last things we do when we're looking for unusual tension, unusual tightness, and the body will tell the truth. So we'll get to the very end of something and it's like, mm, I still have this tightness in my chest and I'm floating back. When's another time you remember feeling that way? And then we're going with that. So there's, it's a, a delicate, we need to know when we need to slow down, when we can speed up, um, and it is okay not to get what we call a zero disturbance fully believing a positive cognition in a clear body scan because there might be all these other things that we need to touch first. So it's not about zeros and sevens and clear body scans. It's about tell me what you truly are experiencing because there's no reason for us to move any faster. Mm -hmm. There's cognition in there. Um, I'm not lovable. And how many times did that show up in my world? and I'm going into all the memory networks around it. And so then when I'm trying to install a positive cognition, I'm lovable. 
I believe that's like, you know, a six out of one to seven, but there's a whole world between six and seven. So sometimes it even comes into I'm learning that I'm a lovable person. I'm learning I'm worthy of love and belonging. And they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense to me. So it's, it's really, really about knowing the client and where they're at and that sometimes saying I'm safe, I don't know if I believe that, right? Like we live in an unsafe world. Like I don't, I don't know if I could even get that into, but I'm learning how to keep myself safe today. Sure, yeah, because my adult self is online. I'm making adult choices today and adult decisions that I couldn't make back then because mm -hmm. it was completely out of my control. Shame-based messages or negative cognitions, a lot more tricky to work with. Shame-based messages are, they're real, they just get like these little itty bitty, like almost like claws into a lot of different areas. And to think the exact opposite of that is it's really hard for a full system to understand. So we go into the, I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning that this might be a possibility. I like the new term, the state of opinion state of okayness. You'll learn in EMDR there's even like a safe, we do a safe place. Uh, I, I don't even use that word anymore. It's pleasant, calm, enough. <laughs> I'm safe enough, I'm present enough. Like, is enough of you here? Is enough of you on board right now? Because surely the girl back there who experienced all of this is like, what the fuck are you doing right now? We <laughs> promised we would never tell anyone about this. And now you're doing this? like. The other cool thing about EMDR is they don't have to say everything. You don't need to know everything they're experiencing. Yeah. Okay, so my ignorance, you said EMDR a bunch of times. I don't even know what that is. So EMDR is eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. And basically, the is we are taking, based off conceptualization, what's going on with you present day? Can we float back? Can we think of the time we first felt that? And we pick a memory. Um, it's usually distressing in nature. You usually don't want to, and, and there's so much complexity to this, but I'll, this is the top line of it. If the client can go there, we'll usually try to go with the earliest memory first because it tends to expand out into more neural networks than hitting some present day stuff. However, if a client doesn't want to go there or they don't have the capacity to, I might do some present day stuff just so that they can feel a little bit of relief and feel a little bit of confidence. So what I'm doing is I'm asking a series of questions regarding the memory. I'm asking about emotions that are tied to it. I'm asking about negative beliefs that are tied to it. I'm asking how they wanna feel about it instead. I'm asking on some scaled questions just for our knowledge of like, where are we on this? And then I'm asking where they feel it in their body. And once that, what I'm doing is I'm lighting up the neural network where it's actually stored. And then once that's alive, we do a bilateral stimulation, whether it's buzzies in your hands, earphones on your ears, or a light bar in front of you. And really, <clears throat> what the, it always looks different, but what the client is doing is traveling down memory networks that are closely associated. So they may stay in the incident, but they may travel into all the other incidences where they felt they weren't enough. Those all cross those neural pathways. So, or they may travel based off of sensation. Like I've always had this heaviness in my chest and it's almost like the chest is showing you what it's holding, all the memories that are associated with it. So I'm doing a certain set and the client may experience a lot of different memories or they may be in one memory and I'm pausing and I'm asking very vague questions. What do you get now? Where did you land? What memory, what feeling, what emotion, what body sensation? You're gonna give me a little teeny bit and I'm gonna say just go with it and we travel and we travel and we travel and we travel as long as we need to travel for with the hope eventually that we're putting some adaptive information in there some new understanding from my adult brain now understands I was actually a kid when that happened that person was the adult it wasn't my fault I was a kid or um, it usually fall, negative cognitions will usually fall into three different realms. They'll fall into like a somehow of I'm responsible. They'll fall into safety, a time when I, I literally, my life was in danger and, um, and I thought I was going to die or they'll fa fall into some sort of control 
where they, they lacked control over what they needed at that moment. Um, and what we're trying to put in there is the understanding that I have today, but it needs to be put into that memory back there. So the, the bilateral movement, right, left brain, talking to one another. I'm dropping into affect, I'm making, I'm making sense of the story. And it's, it's, it's helping all of those neurons fully function so that the whole brain is working, not just the memory network that's being triggered. So now it's integrated, it's more integrated. that make any sense whatsoever it's it's, it's hard I, I always tell my clients like after you do a day of reprocessing you're gonna understand what this is much more yeah Jamie so the only thing I would add to that I think <clears throat> so EMDR is tapping into the brain's uh, memory processing system that already exists naturally so rapid eye movement that occurs uh, during deep sleep what your brain is doing during that period of time is taking that day's information and it's storing it into different file boxes. It's making in sense of it. Mm -hmm. And so we're actually, with the bilateral movement, we're mimicking rapid eye movement um, and giving the brain the uh, uh, time and space to process those memories that were floating, like mm -hmm. Cassandra was saying, uh, to store those away adaptively so they're not fragmented anymore. So it's actually kind of tapping into um, our body's um, natural healing capabilities. That already exists. I describe it sometimes like if your brain was a house and your house had an attic and in the back of the attic there was a closet is that your brain kind of opens up that door and it shoves it in there and it, when we experience trauma something that's overwhelming something we can't make sense of and it just kind of opens it up and puts it in there and it shuts the door and it's like ah, I, don't care. I, don't, I don't know how to process that I don't know how to make sense of that it doesn't make sense and it opens up puts it in there and close it opens up puts it in and close it and when someone finally ends up in my office, the last thing got shoved in there and it attempted to shut the door and now it's kind of spilling out all over the place. And it's like, I don't know what's happening to me. Like I feel awful. And it's, it's like the, the, the memories can't go in a file cabinet and just be tucked in there and shoved away. Like that makes sense. It's over and my whole day made sense and it's just kind of filed away properly. It's like these floaters out there that aren't integrated in and we're looking at integrating them in. I have one that I that I do. It's that computer, like when the computer doesn't, you get the beach ball, mm -hmm. because the nervous system, if it has a reaper, like you're triggered, the nervous system goes back, and it's trying to figure it out, and it cognitively can't reach it. So it's always trying to do this thing while you're living life, and, and you don't get to settle. Your nervous system doesn't go. Oh, I get it's it. over it's yeah so it's always trying to process it a little bit and so it fatigues the system it's kind of like another way I describe it it's almost like you're giving your brain a, a software update it's in these parts it hasn't gotten to that it's like it's it's the, the it's it, it didn't the software update didn't get way back there it, it got to everything else but it didn't get to these memories back here. It's, so it's like we're updating the whole software and like she's saying the nervous system is always a little on overdrive because it's, it's like, I can't figure this one out, so I'm just gonna let it run in the background a little bit. It just runs, so I'm running a little high or a little dissociated, a little bit shut down. So, last slide, I hope. So, in utilizing the understandings of attachment, neurodevelopment, and somatic psychology, and the brain's mechanisms of processing information through the past, present, and future lived experiences, what was destroyed can be rebuilt. Thank you. Well, your ideal client. <laughs> My ideal client, uh, if they want to do an intensive, um, really uh, someone who already has a primary therapist, who's already been working with a therapist, um, and is stable. So capacity needs to be a little bit there. We do do um, stabilization intensives as well, which is really kind of like a deep dive very quickly into polyvagal, um, into parts work, and into yoga, movement, anything like that. But just a capa the capacity and the willingness, the, the wanting yeah. to, to problem solve um, kind of their present day experiences. Openness to maybe it's the past. Yeah. 
Um, you talk about attachment theory. How often do you bump into vanishing twin? Vanishing twin? Yeah. I don't think I've ever heard that. Oh, okay. Um, some, sometimes people can be traumatized because as Compass sales, they had a twin and the twin passed. And so. I have not. There's a whole website. Yeah, I have <laughs> not. I have not. I have not encountered that. But I'd be curious. Every time I hear someone's story, I, I just am in such awe of the, how adaptive we are and the strategies that we develop to survive. It is amazing to me. And to undo all of, not all of it, but a lot, to understand it, to pull it out and to understand it, it is such an honor because it, it means that the system is trusting a, a human and the human is the one that hurt them in the first place they trust me so it really really is an honor it's very deep it's deep work a lot of tears a lot of snot I've got a lot of tissue boxes in my office um, but the reports that I get back are just I mean it warms my it's not like they're perfect like a little bow and there's no no issues for the rest of their life but it the relief they get from not living in chronic fight flight fawn is huge um, or or dissociated just can't even feel my body. I can't feel anything. Um, to see someone kind of come back from that is really, really amazing. What's fawn? Fawn is um, a trauma response, um, people pleasing. Okay. That that I'm going to take care of all of you, and my needs don't matter. Um, learned in childhood. I learned that one. And it's amazing, like, once you kind of learn more about it, like, how, all the areas it shows up in your life, right? It usually happens when we have, like, a, a really, uh, like, a dysregulated parent. And we, as the kid, try and create an atmosphere where that won't happen. So I'm going to be a good little girl, or I'm going to sweep, or I'm going to just go hide in my room, or I'm going to do all these things so that you stay regulated. And it shows up in adults today where they get really uncomfortable with someone who's dysregulated and they'll do whatever it takes to get you regulated, even if it's at my own expense, because my needs don't matter. Anyone else have any questions? Well, how do you stay, how do you not take on their dense energy? I don't, you know, it's it, it was a um, journey for sure. I, I say overall, I've, I've really done a good job at it. There are moments where I need to Call a coworker, and I just need. There are some stories that really hurt me to my core, and it's hard and difficult. Um, but I think it's it's always really understanding that sometimes my own trauma helps in the room. Like when I can say me too, or I can say I I can feel that to the core of who I am. I know that feeling is that to be seen and heard and understood is half of what they're looking for. Um, but also to know what's mine and what's not mine. I don't, need to, I don't need to take on anyone else's because I have enough of my own and then I do my own work, right? Like I, I, it, it has to be that way or I would not be able to do what I do. I wouldn't. So it has to kind of stay out in a bubble and it's like learning to hold the space here that it doesn't need to come on me because it's not helpful for you if it's coming on me. You just want to be heard and seen and understood and that's not gonna help if I'm hijacked by your trauma. Right. So really like picturing it like here, it's here. It's the story that's here. It's the emotions that are here. They don't need to come on me. But I have cried. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I work with some, it is horrific the things that have happened to humans out there. Um, and to sometimes really hold space for that. It, it, I do need a release. You know, at the end, sudden crying is our parasympathetic nervous system kicking in to relax us. So I'm, I'm honoring it. I'm just gonna cry because I know it'll be over, and then I just need my body needed to release. I do a lot of like shaking exercises, like getting energy off of me, and just, just clean it out. And on to the next. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you for what you do. Thanks guys, thanks.